Hello, my name is Joe Swan, and I'm standing on what was once my grandfather's farm. His name was Caner Swan. He and his brother Will were business partners, and they farmed this land during the first half of the 20th century. Throughout their lives, they witnessed many events that were historically significant, such as World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II. They also saw a lot of changes in the way farming was done. Near the end of his life, my grandfather was heard to say, When I was young, I studied by the light of an oil lamp, and now I read my newspaper by an electric light. I rode in a buggy, and now I have ridden in an airplane. I cut wheat with a cradle, and now I have driven a self-propelled combine. One part of my grandfather's farming experience was the steam engine. The invention of the steam traction engine opened the door to many technological advances in agriculture in an age where work was either done by hand or with the aid of livestock. Farming was still labor intensive, but the farmer could harness steam power to work more efficiently. So the steam engine became a part of farm life and its whistle began to announce the advance of seasons just as much as the blooming of dogwood trees in the spring or the first autumn frost. The steam whistle is no longer a part of the rhythm of life. It has been replaced by the growl of a diesel engine. I imagine I wouldn't get many takers on an offer to return to the steam era, but it sure is fun to remember the days when those whistles called farmers to their work. This is KG-1875. Its name, which is given for the sake of this film, comes from its manufacturer, the Keck Gonnerman Company, and the serial number of its boiler. Records show that it was built in 1924 and sold on June the 18th of that year. KG-1875 is a two-cylinder engine and is rated at 22 horsepower. It is currently owned by Paul and Jackie Swan, father and son. Built in 1924, and Dad and my grandfather bought it from a fellow by the name of Mr. D. Freeman, who owned a farm up around Milldale. He bought it from the factory, which it was sent back to the factory two years after it was built to have a new boiler put on it. This engine, for the first two years, thrashed wheat out west on a circuit out there. And <coughs> The boiler evidently wasn't big enough, and they sent it back to the factory and reworked it and put a new boiler on it, and Mr. Freeman bought it after it had been reworked at the factory. Uh, Mr. Freeman, all he used it for was steam plant beds where the thrash his own personal wheat. He had a huge farm, around a thousand acres up in the post oil in there. And, D and D Mr. D. Freeman was a very unique person. He never married. <coughs> Him and his mother lived together in this farmhouse. And he was kind of a little peculiar, but Dad was one of his closest friends. Dad asked him one time, said, D, I'd like to have that in if you ever want to get rid of it. He said, well, I don't, I don't really need it. He said, I wouldn't sell it to anybody but you, so they bought it. D. Freeman said, no, he wouldn't sell it for nothing. He just, me and him was all for good friends. And one night he called me and says, well, says, you're the only one I'd sell that engine to, because I know you're going to keep it. And so I gave him $1,200 for it. And I told my daddy, I said, if you go over and pay for it, I'll, I'll work it out with steaming plant beds and, and pay for it. And he said, all right, if you'll do that. I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I'm proud of it. It's a good engine. The Keck Gonnerman Company was located in Mount Vernon, Indiana. They built their first engine in 1884 and production continued until 1930. 
Bob Kick, there's, he was the uh, owner of it. Uh, Kick and Goneman, they were Germans. I, I met Mr. Kick, but when Goneman, he, he, he's dead forever, went up there. And they started that thing as a blacksmith shop. We wound up making engines. And then after the engines played out, they went to making tractors, Kick Goneman tractors. Kent Gonerman produced other lines of equipment along with their steam engines. These lines included mining equipment, portable sawmills, and grain threshers or separators like this one. That separator was purchased, I don't know exactly the year, in the middle or late 40s. Uh, they bought it brand new. Uh, Back dad uh, said something to father one, one afternoon. He says, let's go to Mount Vernon in the morning. He says, well, why do we wait? Why don't we just go now? And uh, so they went to Mount Vernon with no intention of buying anything. And when they was up there, they decided to buy this, the thrasher. And uh, the, the people from Mount Vernon delivered the thrasher to the farm. And it was on rubber at that time. They had wheels. That, <coughs> They would attach to it to his own rubber and they drove, they pulled it from out running in Indiana to the farm. But when they got to the farm, they put the steel wheels on and carried the rubber wheels back. Uh, in fact, at that time, my grandfather was in partners with uh, Mr. Will Swan in farming. And that's why the name Swan Brothers is on the separator because at the time they were in partners and they were the ones who purchased the Indian. After the, the thrasher, after the partnership broke up, the thrasher, uh, this thrasher went to uh, our side of the family, and uh, the other thrasher went to Will's side of the family, along with another family. Will and Caner Swan grew up on a farm near Cross Plains, Tennessee, at the end of the 19th century. As adults, they settled in their home community and continued the farming tradition. The Swan Brothers, like other farmers in Robertson County, grew most of their own food. This included raising cows, hogs, and chickens for dairy products and meat. Their main cash crops were tobacco and wheat. The partnership between Will and Caner began when they bought a steam engine and separator. This allowed them to thresh their own wheat and do custom work for other farmers. In time, the steam era came to a close. Farmers, having purchased newer equipment, parked their engines somewhere out of the way. KG 1875 suffered this fate until the late 1960s when Paul and Jackie decided to restore it. When I started restoring this engine, it was sitting up there in that field, in that little barn. It had sprout growing up through the wheels, had a beehive in the and the boiler. I finally got all of, all of that cut out and drug it home and started started restoring it. Of course, the upkeep on this thing is pretty uh, hard. You got a lot of upkeep. I had to refluid it and I, I put coal bins on it now. This makes the third set of coal bins and the third set of water tanks. So, you know, it's, uh, it's something to do on one all the time. KG 1875 spends its retirement overlooking one of the farms it once worked on, but each year it travels to Adams, Tennessee for the threshing show. The show is organized by the Tennessee-Kentucky Threshermen's Association as an effort to recreate life on the farm as it was long ago. It is a three-day event that is scheduled for the third weekend of July. The threshing show has been an annual event since 1970. There have been as many as 13 engines attending in under steam. However, fewer engines have been able to attend since 1988 when the Tennessee Boiler Board issued new safety regulations concerning antique boilers. The show features a program full of things to see and do. Some of the highlights include a parade, music and clogging performances, tractor and mule pools, and a steam-powered sawmill. The flea market has a variety of arts and crafts as well as antiques for sale. 
There are lots of old cars, trucks, tractors, and farm implements on static display. And there is plenty of food with a shady place to eat in the middle of all the action. KG1875 helps bring another main attraction to life, the wheat threshing demonstrations. The steam engine was the first portable mechanical power source available to farmers. The earliest models appeared on the market a few years after the American Civil War, but it wasn't until the 1880s that the first self-propelled engines were produced. These were immediately popular. Steam engines create their power by releasing the chemical energy stored in fuels like coal or wood and converting it to the mechanical energy needed to run equipment like a thrasher or a sawmill. This is easy to understand by looking at how all the parts work together. The largest part of an engine is the boiler. It is a cylindrical tank that is the midsection of the machine and is where the water is heated to make steam. The fuel that is used to heat the water is burned in the firebox which is mounted on the rear of the boiler. The floor of the firebox is a grate. This allows the ashes to fall into the ash pan below. The ash pan door is called the damper, and it can be opened and closed to regulate the airflow into the firebox. This is how the engineer controls the amount of heat the fire produces. The cylindrical sides of the boiler extend past the boiler's front wall. This area is called the smoke box. The smokestack rises from the top of the smoke box. The smoke travels from the firebox to the smoke box through tubes that run the length of the boiler. These tubes are called flues. This increases the heating efficiency of the engine. A steam dome is built on top of the boiler. Steam collects here and is tapped for powering the steam cylinder. A safety valve is also mounted here to prevent steam pressure from building to a dangerous level. The steam cylinder is where all the mechanical action takes place. It is usually mounted on top of the boiler and a valve chest is built onto the side of it. Two steam ports connect the valve chest to either end of the cylinder. Steam is piped from the steam dome and passes through the throttle valve before entering the cylinder. Steam enters and leaves the cylinder through the valve chest. Once in the cylinder, the steam pushes the piston back and forth. The valve also moves back and forth to route the incoming steam to one side of the piston while allowing exhaust steam to exit from the other side of the piston. All this is a lot easier to understand when the parts are set into motion. Steam engines provide a very smooth power. This is because steam is being used to push the piston each time it makes a stroke in the cylinder. The exhaust steam is piped to the base of the smokestack and vented up the stack with the smoke. This helps to create more airflow through the firebox and flues so the fire will produce more heat. Outside the cylinder, the reciprocating motion of the piston is used to turn the drive wheel or pulley. The rods that connect the piston to the drive wheel shaft causes the wheel to rotate. This is similar to a bicyclist pumping the pedals of a bike to move forward. A belt is looped around the drive wheels of the engine and a piece of equipment like a thrasher to run the equipment. Just like a bicycle chain connects the pedal gear to the rear wheel to turn the wheel. The rear wheel of a steam engine is also connected to the drive wheel through a simple transmission and a clutch so it can move under its own power. Steam engines only have two gears, forward and reverse.
but I never will forget driving that engine at home. It's the last engine that the case people made, and I don't know what date it was. Well, it was, uh, brought, it was 1937 when we brought it home. I don't know when it was made, but anyway, it shifted to Nashville on a barge, unloaded down at that old wharf building on the end of Broad. Me and Tall went over there and pulled it out of that building with a truck and pulled it up First Street. There behind J.I. Keith's building on First Street and built a fire in it and put water and built a fire and greased it and got it ready to come home and come up, <laughs> coming up First Street and got the front wheels in the streetcar track and couldn't get it out. I had to go get two iron wedges to pull up on that and get it out and I finally got it out. Come on across Woodland Street Bridge, come on to Goodness for the first night. And, uh, we lived in Goodlesford and four miles an hour where the half it would go and we got, well, it took me two days to bring it home from Nashville. And I started steaming plant beds so when I come over 31 Beggy and steam plant beds so all the way home. Steam engines require a considerable amount of maintenance that has to be done each morning in preparation for the day's work. The morning routine includes cleaning the soot out of all the flues. KG 1875 has 47 flues. Filling the boiler and water tanks with water. Greasing all the moving parts. And cleaning the ashes from the firebox and ash pan. Once most of these things are done, a fire can be started. Well, it takes about an hour <clears throat> in the morning to get the steam up. And after you get the steam up, then you've got to keep the steam up and under, under pressure, under when you're working a heavy load, you've got to take into consideration your water if, and your coal or wood, if you're burning coal or wood, uh, your damper on the bottom, and uh, you just got to watch everything. And if, you're, if your steam pressure starts to go down, you've got to put more fuel to it. If it gets up and it starts getting ready to pop off, you've got to put more water to it and close your damper. And it's just a matter of kind of like juggling in rocks and trying to keep the hottest in the air. Everybody's not suited for it because some people like to get one thing or forget the other thing. That's what makes one of these things so dangerous. If you get the water down below the fan seat, it's going to blow up. So you've got to make sure you got water to glass, side glass all the time. The engine basically is not really that hazardous if you got a good operator on it. I've never seen one blow up. I've seen this one and several more spring leaks for speed. But you've got time to get your fire out and get it cooled off. It wasn't this engine, it was another engine that they bought new that I remember him telling me the tale about the, they drove it from Nashville to Cross Plains and when they got up around White House they started steaming plant beds and it took them about two months to get the engine home. They got it home, put it up and they started thrashing wheat the next summer and he never did check the, the plug in the front of the boiler and it come from the factory just they screwed it in there hand tight. The plug blew out of the front end of the boiler went all the way to the separator. It's fortunate nobody's standing in front of it. A little thing like that can happen to you.
And in a lot of places, back a long time ago, they, they furnished the fuel for the engine. And a lot of times they just put poles out there and you just chop up the wood to fire the engine. <laughs> Wasn't no wind to it. And at the sawmill, we used slabs to fire the engine. At the, at the mill, we had to chop them into and spit it up to put it in the engine to fire it to pull the engine, pull the thread, or pull the saw. We never did use coal at the sawmill. Use slabs. I rigged up a cutoff saw behind the engine. It come off the flywheel. I had to put another pulley on it and pull it. The saw. All he had to do is cut his wood and get ready to put it in the engine. I made an elevator that what wood that they didn't use at the engine. It saw it up and stowed it length and it piled it up out on the outside. Charlie, I think he's about the, as good a boy as I ever tried to learn on the engine. He got a hold of it pretty quick, and he, 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 he's pretty watchful, and he takes care of that engine. He does a good job. In other words, the first thing you've got to have in your mind is you, you like it. And you've got to like your work. And I enjoy food with the engine. I enjoy farming. Will and Caner Swan used their steam engines for three different jobs on their farms. Steaming tobacco plant beds, running a sawmill, and thrashing wheat. And once they had finished their own work, they would do custom work for farmers who didn't own a steam engine. Tobacco has always been one of Robertson County's main cash crops. Tobacco seeds are sown in plant beds early in the spring and the young plants are transplanted to the field after a few weeks of growth. Farmers would prepare ground for their plant beds in the late fall or early spring. This involved plowing a 12 foot by 75 foot strip of ground for each plant bed to be sown and using some method to kill the weed seeds that were in the ground. That's where the steam engine came in for many farmers. I had a big uh, pan that was about uh a foot deep and it was uh, the width of a plant bed which was about 12 by 12 it had handles on each corner and you'd lay this you'd work your ground up and put this pan down on it and take a pipe from the steam dome and stick under the pan and then take a hole and hole up around the pan and that turn the steam on and lay the steam on for approximately 12 to 15 minutes underneath this pan and that would kill all the uh, seed, everything in the ground. And then they'd have four, four men there and they'd go on each corner and they'd pick the pan up and go and set it down again and just keep on doing that because each steam plant is for the public too. Well, it actually, they, 
most of the mill work that they did was custom work. Uh, the farmers ran that, they wanted to build a barn or a house or something, they'd cut their own timber and bring it to the mill and they would, they would uh, saw their lumber for so much a foot. And I don't know how much a foot they got for it. Basically that's how they, they, they really never was in the lumber business per se. They did custom work for all the farmers in the area. Wheat threshing was probably the biggest reason a farmer in Middle Tennessee would have purchased a steam engine. A steam engine and separator allowed a farmer to raise more grain and still be able to harvest his crop in a reasonable amount of time. Even with this equipment, harvest time was a busy time and a community effort. Farmers in the southeastern United States raise winter wheat. This type of wheat grows well in climates that don't have extremely cold winters. It is sown in the late fall using a wheat drill like this one and sprouts before winter sets in. By late spring it is ready for harvest. The first stage of the harvest is to cut the wheat with a binder. This piece of equipment cuts the wheat and ties it into bundles. This binder was used to cut wheat in preparation for the threshing show. I've cut a lot of wheat in my lifetime. We'd get out here and cut wheat all over the country here, about 300 acres, maybe four, for two dollars an acre. <laughs> We had a 10-foot cut binder on the last we cut 30 acres a day. But there's a rule of uh, binders is about six and seven. But we had a, that last binder we had was a 10-foot cut. And we could cut 25 or 30 acres a day and not have any trouble. We'd get started about 9, 30, 10 o'clock and you would get off and work till dark. We didn't want to cut it with the dews on it. It would well, take about 9 o'clock before we'd ever get started anyway because we had to grease it and get everything ready to start with and get everything going. And we cut a lot of wheat. So we did. Now you've seen them cut wheat down here last, for the thresher show, you know. And I didn't think the thing would even tie the first bundle, but it did. Done a wonderful job, and that fellow that run that road that binder knows what he's doing. He's, he's a good man. You know, he's, uh, he's got a mechanical head on him. Good fella. They thrash wheat a little earlier than they said they do to it then. See, what happened, you had to cut the wheat while it was just a little green to keep from losing all the, the wheat out of the, out of the head. And they'd, they'd shock it and let it dry in the shock and then they'd go and start thrashing.
nature of what happened back then. Dad would uh, go from farm to farm, and it, it was kind of like a club. You may have 10 to 15 farmers in this particular club. All these farmers would help one another. So he, Dad would go to one farm, thrash all of his wheat, and all the neighbors would be there and head. Then he'd leave there and go to another farm and start thrashing. Yeah, I can remember my dad would uh, always sometime be on the separator and uh, he uh, would take a little BB pistol and shoot a, one of the mules in the rear end and of course they'd go crazy. He told me one time and had an old farmer there that had a little 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 team of mules and the harness was about three times too big. He did that to them and they backed out of the harness and went home left him there to separate with the wagon. All the women in the neighborhood too would just bring the food there, you know, they'd eat. It's just a big community gathering what it amounted to. Kind of like a, and the food, you know, they eat well. It was all country cooked, you know, basically. That's how I remember it. A lot of hard work. Pulled a thresher out at 20th of June. That was his date that he always started threshing the wheat. Well, it'd take about 25 or 30 wagons, and always had uh, about two at the threshing, one to fire the engine, and one to haul water. There's about four went with the thresher and the rig. But now they were thrashed in clubs. And they go through that club, it'll be another club ready waiting for you to start on another club, you see. We thrashed devil crop of wheat from Cross Plains to Springfield one year. Wound up down at the lake. That's where the that's where I thrashed the last straw stack and pulled it in and drove it home. We was out about three weeks that year. Thrashed a lot of wheat. We'd run about a thousand bushel a day. Dime a bushel. And that had to be a good day to get a thousand bushel. Engine maintenance was only part of the morning routine for the threshing crew. While steam pressure was building in the engine, the crew could turn their attention to the separator. Lubrication was a daily chore. Other tasks were done as needed. The belts, for example, would have been removed if there had been a heavy rain to keep them dry. If the belts got wet, they would have poor traction and slip. The wind stacker is the exhaust for the straw and chaff. It would need to be unstowed from its traveling position each time the separator was set up at a different farm. The mechanism that swings the wind stacker into position behind the separator could be powered by a pulley with a drive belt, as well as a hand crank. Then the wind stacker could be set to oscillate and spread the straw stack over a larger area. Some farmers would build a skeleton shed on the spot where the straw stack was to go. By the time all the farmer's wheat had been threshed, the straw stack would completely cover the shed on all sides but one. The following winter, the farmer could put his cows in the old wheat field, and there would be a shelter ready for them to use when the weather was bad. Other farmers may have chosen to bale their straw so they could move it into a barn. Of course, new straw meant fresh mattress filling in everyone's bed. While all this activity is taking place at the engine and the separator, and after the dew burns off, the Teamsters would head out to the field to pick up their first loads of wheat. 
Their job would be to keep a continuous stream of wheat coming to the separator. The separator was to run all day, with only a break for lunch planned. The threshing show of today takes place a full month later than when the wheat would have normally been threshed. So rather than leave the wheat shocked in the field for that time, it is picked up on the day it is cut and stored in a barn. But the job these teamsters have remains the same. The separator performs two jobs in the process of harvesting wheat. It threshes the wheat to separate it from the stalk and it winnows the grain to remove the chaff. When the bundles of wheat are first fed into the separator, they come to two parts that handle the threshing job. One of these parts is the concave. This is a non-moving metal framework that is curved and has teeth that point inward. The other part is a cylinder. It sits inside the concave. It is also a metal framework and has teeth that point outward. The cylinder rotates, and as it does, its teeth pass between the teeth on the concave. As the wheat comes into this area, the teeth on the cylinder grabs the wheat and pulls it through the teeth on the concave. This action strips the heads of grain from the stalks, threshing the wheat. The grain then drops through the concave onto the grain pan below. The distance between the concave and the cylinder is adjustable. This allows the separator to thresh other types of grain like barley, oats, or rice. The stalks or straw comes out of the back side of the concave and lands on a conveyor system made of several parts called the straw walkers. These parts move the straw to the rear of the separator where it can be blown out the wind stacker. There is a second smaller cylinder that is located just behind the main cylinder that is not drawn in the animation. This smaller cylinder beats the straw as it leaves the main cylinder and concave to knock off any heads of grain that happen to remain on the stalk. The grain in the grain pan is now ready for winnowing. The grain pan has a corrugated bottom and vibrates around 215 beats per minute. This action helps to separate the husks or chaff from the grain as it moves the grain to the rear of the pan, where it can fall onto the sieve below. The sieve is similar to the grain pan except that it has holes in it that are just large enough for the grain to fall through. The size of the holes in the sieve are also adjustable to accommodate different types of grain. A fan is also placed below the grain pan and sieve and blows air up through the underside of the sieve. This wind will pick up the chaff and blow it to the rear of the separator where it can be blown out the wind stacker with the straw. When the clean grain drops through the sieve, it is collected and funneled into an elevator where it is lifted to a small hopper before being dumped into a sack. This elevator works by running a long chain with paddles attached through a vertical chute. Even after all this, there are some heads of grain that gets through the equipment in need of threshing and winnowing again. Rather than waste this grain, it is collected as it falls off the end of the sieve, funneled into a second elevator, and dumped back into the cylinder and concave for a second go around. And here's a look at all of the parts with the straw walkers back in the picture. When everything is ready, it's time to go to work. The whistle was used to announce that the separator was ready to go. The engineer would also blow the whistle when he was running low on water and a continuous series of short blasts from the whistle was a sound no one wanted to hear. It was the distress signal.
The wheat feeder was an accessory and a relatively new invention. Older separators, like this one, did not have this feature. This required someone to cut the twine holding the bundles of wheat together and feed the wheat directly into the cylinder. The grain sacker was another accessory. Nowadays grain is dumped into a truck or trailer and taken to market. Years ago it had to be sacked in one bushel sacks. That created another job for two people which is not reenacted here. The grain sacker collects the grain in a small hopper as it comes out of the separator. When a half bushel of wheat has accumulated in the hopper, it tips and dumps the wheat down a chute to fill an empty sack. Then the sack was tied and loaded on a truck. Prior to this invention, the wheat came out and was measured in bushel baskets before being sacked. Each threshing crew had someone who stayed with the separator throughout the day. This person was responsible for making sure the equipment was in top shape and doing a good job for the conditions of the wheat. For Paul Swan, that man was his uncle, Tarver Durrett. He's good. I always said he had a mechanical ear. He could tell when a bell was slipping. He, he, just, he, he was a good mechanic. He couldn't beat him. You could tell when the bells were slipping by the different sound of the hum of the main machine. I like it, might yet do that. But uh, you just got to have your mind on what you're doing. A lot of things in the separator, you've got to keep a certain RPM. You got to keep your concaves it's on the conditions of the wheat where you adjust your concaves up and down, you know, to check if the grain that, that goes through it to keep it from going blowing over in the smoke in the haystack. You don't want that. You have to, and if you, a lot of times if you got these little white caps that the cylinder don't get out. And he goes back and hit that cyclone fan he throws it in the snow in the snow stack. You got to watch that. And you open your seals where he'll take care of that them things and it elevates it, goes back and goes back through the cylinder, you see, and rethreshes it, keeps it from going back to it, blowing it over. There's a lot of wheat wasted in these combines. You see it coming up all over the ground behind it. And ain't no need of it.
The steam era was a lot shorter on the farm than it was on the railroad. Steam power had been in use before the Civil War, but it was sometime around the 1880s when steam engines began to be widely used on farms. The internal combustion engine was being developed at this time, and pretty soon steam engine manufacturers like Kit Gonnerman, seeing the way of the future, began to retool their factories for assembling tractors. By the 1920s, the first tractors appeared on the market, and as these new tractors caught on, they began to replace their steam-powered ancestors. The tractor was a real technological breakthrough for the farmer. They were safer, easier to maintain and operate, and could perform a wider variety of jobs. As engineers kept improving the design of the tractor, they began to dream up improvements to other equipment as well. Eventually, someone got the idea to marry the binder and the separator, inventing the combination harvester thresher, or combine. These first combines were pulled behind tractors. But it wasn't long before they were given a motor all their own and the self-propelled combine was produced. This was the only self-propelled combine Caner Swan ever owned. It was one of the early models made by Gleaner and its header had a 10-foot cut. Combines have changed a lot since the 1950s. The header on this combine has a 25 foot cut, small by today's standards, but just the right size for farms in Robertson County. It can easily cover 50 acres of ground in a day, if the grain can be hauled away fast enough. This combine is also used to harvest soybeans and, with a different header, corn. And the farmer now has the luxury of working in an air-conditioned cab away from all the dust and noise. The changes over the last 60 years have been dramatic and reach past the farming methods to touch the people and their culture. The whistles on engines like KG 1875 are silent. Their time has come and gone and they now stand as monuments to the past. Mm -hmm.